You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 71. For October 28th, 2015, I'm your host, Chris Webster. On today's show, we talk to Dr. Randy McGuire, a professor for the MA in Public Anthropology program at Binghamton University. This sounds like a solid program for someone interested in a graduate degree relating to CRM. It's also, as you'll hear, somewhat of a backdoor into Southwestern archaeology. So tell your friends that you're going to be their boss someday and go fill out your grad school application because the CRM Archaeology Podcast starts right now. Welcome to the show, everyone. Joining me today is Bill in Arizona. Hello. Oh. And Chris Sims in Ridgecrest, California. Hi. All right. And joining us to talk about the new MA program at uh, Binghamton University in New York State is Dr. Randy McGuire. Welcome to the podcast, Randy. How's it going? It's going well. Thank you, Chris. Awesome. All right. So before we get into this, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself so we know so we know who we're talking to and uh, and what your background is. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm currently a distinguished professor of anthropology at Binghamton University. Um, I'm originally from the West. I'm originally from Fort Collins, Colorado. And I did my BA at the University of Texas and my MA and PhD at the University of Arizona. My own field work is primarily in northern Mexico, Sonora, Mexico, just south of Arizona. Um, I've been, I was uh, started my career in archaeology and contract archaeology. And I did about uh, six years working primarily for the Arizona State Museum and also for Arizona State University. I did about six years, six, seven years, and I was everything from a field tech to a uh, principal investigator. Um, and that, that uh, in part, relates to some of my um, interests in the, in the program we've set up at Binghamton. Well, let's, let's get into that program. Um, first, tell everybody who, who may not be aware of this where Binghamton, New York is. That's up, upstate New York, right? Yeah, Binghamton, New York is uh, upstate New York. We're actually very clear, uh, very close to the Pennsylvania border north of Scranton. Um, that's where I live. Uh, but you only have to go about 10 or 15 miles south of campus near Pennsylvania. Okay. All right. Well, let's kick this off. And why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about the program? Like, for example, you know, what, what type of program is, what it's called first off so people can find it. And then uh, a little bit about the program, like how uh, I would say how old it is, you know, how long it's been around, and then we'll get into some more questions after that. Okay, the the program is officially called an MA in Public Archaeology. It is part of our, uh, you know, it's, it's a track in our normal uh, master's degree. Uh, the program is quite new. Uh, we will be accepting students next year. Uh, however, uh, training people to work in CRM is not new. We, we've been doing that at Binghamton University since the 1970s. Uh, Binghamton was actually a pioneer in the Northeast in contract archaeology, modern contract archaeology, when it was set up in the 70s. Uh, I wasn't there then, but uh, uh, there were people doing it. And so we have, uh, over the years, trained uh, many, many, many uh, uh, archaeologists who currently work in CRM, both uh, primarily in the eastern United States, but uh, uh, other places across the country also. And we decided a couple of years ago that we wanted to formalize that training in a program. We, we have a well-established record. We have a uh, functioning contract archaeology program, in other words, a public archaeology facility that does contract archaeology. And it's actually one of the first that was established, again, under the modern uh, regime of uh, cultural resource management in the mid-1970s. Okay. Um, and uh, so that's been an integral part of the uh, integral relationship to the department. Uh, so in many ways, what we're doing with this program is not starting something new so much as formalizing something we've been doing for a very long time. You guys have been doing contract archaeology from the university up in the, you know, since the 70s. That's a very northeastern thing, isn't it? It seems like a number of universities up there nowadays, anyway, have CRM firms. Yeah, well, it was originally, you know, CRM actually started in universities, and then for a variety of reasons that probably go beyond what we want to talk about here, uh, one after another, they dropped them. I mean, most of uh, most of my time in CRM, I was working either for the Arizona State Museum, which is part of the University of Arizona, or for Arizona State University, neither of which now have contract programs. Okay. Yeah, you're right. That might be a good topic for a, another podcast I've been working on in the background, but I'll talk to you about that later. <laughs> um, let's get into this. I'd be glad to. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get into this right now. So, so 
when did you guys start the the master's program? Well, first off, what is the master's program called? Because it is an is an MA in um, public archaeology, correct? Yeah, that is the title, public archaeology, because we uh, wanted to, you know, definitely prepare people to work in CRM, but we also wanted to uh, also prepare people who might want to work in museums or, uh, you know, with historical societies or a variety of different kind of heritage uh, related, archaeologically related uh, careers. So do you do you have the ability as a student to focus your studies um, via electives and, and coursework in a certain direction within that program? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I, the more accurate way to put it would be that we, uh, I mean, we feel that, uh, of course, CRM, the core of CRM is heritage. That's why CRM exists. That's why the National, the National Historic Preservation Act exists, is to preserve the heritage of the United States. Mm-hmm. And so we feel that, uh, you know, that people should be trained in that. You know, it's not just a matter of training people, training people as technicians. Okay. Now, keeping that in mind, you're you're teaching people at the graduate level, so, you know, when uh-huh. somebody comes out, when somebody obviously comes out with a graduate degree in CRM, they're looking for management type positions. Typically, not all the time, especially out here in the West, but but typically they're looking to move up into management positions. What kind of courses do you have that that help them in that role? Not just like you know the theory classes and stuff like that, but um, do you have any courses that are designed? Uh, maybe towards CRM managers or, or focus on that and, and help them to that goal? Yeah, we, we have a course, uh, the title of which I should have in front of me, but I, <laughs> more <laughs> I didn't uh, bring with me. Uh, but we, we have a course that we've actually taught uh, for the entire time I've been there, so like for 20 years. Okay. Which is exactly oriented towards that. Um, and uh, so it's an already existing course, and then uh, it is required, uh, you know, would be required for the same degree. Okay, and your other your other instructors in that course, um, do they come with a with a CRM background, um, probably within the university, but do they have something without the uh, you know outside the university as well as a background? Oh yeah, uh, the uh, well, the primary instructor for that course is uh, Nina Versaji, who runs our, a public archaeology facility. So she is an active uh, you know she's active in CRM and and well known in the Northeast. Uh, if that the, the course you're talking about is actually not one that I teach. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely have, uh, the, you know, the people teaching the, the person teaching the course is a person who is also managing an active CRM program. Nice. And what's your, what's your class size? Like how many people do you take in every semester for this program? Uh, we're, we're planning on, uh, admitting about seven or eight students a year. Okay. That's a good, that's a good size. Nice and nice and small. Keeps it, uh, keeps it fresh. Yeah, I think one of the I think one of the advantages we have here is first of all we we do have a long history of doing CRM, so mm-hmm. we're active in it, uh, which means we have a, a great network of alumni who are actively involved in CRM. Again, primarily in the eastern United States, but not only. Also, all, we have uh, five North American archaeologists, and all five of us have uh, extensive CRM experience. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, on the order of six, seven, eight, ten years, um, and um, so I think this gives us, uh, you know, puts us in a good position to to um, you know help people and train people for CRM. Okay, nice. And you know, get this out of the way at the top of the show too. Uh, what is the? Do you know off the top of your head what the date is for getting your application in for the following year? Oh, uh, we. Uh, we would like to have applications by mid-February, <clears throat> but we will accept applications all through t- till the summer. Oh, okay, nice, nice. Yeah. All right. So it's it's uh, fairly open. Okay, and this is a this is a typical master's degree program with a, a thesis requirement and um, things like that. I assume. We do have a thesis requirement. We thought about that very, very uh, long and hard. Uh, A thesis is a ROPA requirement if you're going to become ROPA qualified. So we felt we should have it. Uh, What we, one thing we've done, which again I don't know how unique this is, is we structured the program so that in your second year you hopefully do an you do an internship in uh, the summer between your first and second year, and hopefully from the in the intent one of the intents of the internship will be to come up with uh, thesis material. And then we will have a series of two courses. We have a series of two courses in the, your second year, which are oriented towards guiding the writing of the thesis, um, so so that people 
will you know have a lot of guidance and and I think the, the most important things uh, you know from my experience in CRM one of the most important things to learn is how to make how to meet deadlines and so we're going to try to have a structured you know a structured approach to that that will uh, you know uh, train people in writing but also train people in how to organize writing and do it effectively and you know meet deadlines yeah all all very important stuff. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <Absolutely. laughs> yeah. We were actually just talking on our on our cruise today about projects we've been on that were just uh, the management was, um, uh, to put it kindly, lacking. And and you know it, it really is it really is one of your bigger skills. I mean, you can learn all you want about archaeological theory and all you want about uh, you know anything else, but when it comes down to it, can you manage a large project? Can you manage the, not only the people but the budget and the um, you know everything involved with that. You know, can you can you do all that and then come in on time? Because that's really what most people care about uh, in, in your yeah. in your uh, you know in your company. So and your clients. But that's that's the big thing. Yeah. Well, that's about the only thing the clients care about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Chris, yeah. you wanted a you had a more specific question on some of the some of the job skills. Yeah, uh, Randy. All the details uh, of the program so far sound really exciting and interesting. I have a couple questions. One is uh, the intensive uh, internship that accompanies the, the thesis component. Um, is that going to be mm -hmm. with Binghamton's CRM wing, or do you also have uh, CRM firms that you're partnered with to kind of help place uh, the, the grad students? Well, like I said, we have an extensive network of our graduates who are, are very active in CRM. Uh, again, they tend to be in the eastern United States. As, as you well know, CRM tends to be a regional kind of practice. Uh, and we have uh, we have at the present time, I, I, you know, I, I don't know if I want to see commitments, but expressions of interest might be a good way to put it uh, from at least uh -huh. uh, 20 different uh, firms or agencies uh, wow. for interns. Nice. And, and like I said, in terms of placing interns, this is this is something we were already doing. Uh, you know, again, you know, I can't emphasize enough. In many ways, what this program is doing is is simply formalizing something we've been doing for 30 years. You know, that that makes me think too. What what about your undergrad program? Um, I mean, you've been doing this stuff for 30 years, presumably within the context of the undergrad, maybe some of the other master's degrees you have. I'm not sure, but but what what kind of courses and 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 I guess I guess how do I phrase it? Uh, uh, do you have a, a say CRM track almost that somebody could go on as an undergrad uh, and and really focus on At that the sort undergraduate of route? level? Yeah, no, not really. No. Not really. I mean, certainly, okay. uh, students who no, certainly students who express an interest as undergraduates, we can advise them and guide them and uh, okay. you know get them get them what they need and get them a leg up. Uh, but we don't have a formal program. I mean, in your general of a liberal arts degree that that doesn't actually work out too well at the undergraduate <laughs> level. Yeah, I didn't I didn't think it would, but you know, it sounded like you guys have been having these courses for a while, so I wasn't sure if it was bleeding into that program or not. So No. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I, I think I gathered from earlier too when you were talking about the program that you're generally you're generally trying to get people out of there within probably 2 to 3 years, I assume is the goal. Uh the goal is 2 years. 2 years. Okay. And you are now Tell me again, how long has this this particular degree been around? Well, this particular degree is new. New, Nobody's okay. Graduated from it yet? Brand new. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. But but we 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 of course taught an MA in anthropology. I mean an MA in anthropology with a specialization in archaeology for many many years. Right. Right. Awesome. You know, since okay. long before I came here. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. I think one of the things that we we have to offer. Uh, there are uh, a fair number of programs out there now that are in, you know, either, uh, well, like University of Arizona has one called Arch you know, Archaeology of Practice and mm -hmm. whatnot, and uh, there are a number of CRM programs. And I think what makes us uh, a little different than most of them is that they, uh, most of the programs tend to be of two types. Either they're at universities that only have an MA program and, you know, a terminal MA, they don't offer a PhD, yeah. uh, or uh, – or in some cases, uh, you if you enroll in the um, in the CRM program, you uh, essentially cannot move to the PhD program. And uh, we are uh, integrating this program, this the PhD program. So if someone was to come do a a master's in public archaeology, 
and want to continue in the PhD, mm. it would be quite possible to do. It would not be expected or anything, but it would be quite possible to do. And that would be very different from, like I said, either going to a school that only has an MA program or going to a school, and I won't name any, but I can think of you right <laughs> off the top of my head, where if you enroll in the uh, applied program, uh, you, you're not, in fact, allowed to enter the PhD program. Oh, okay. Well, I have a couple other questions about the uh, CRM program. Um, sure. Speaking from my own experience, uh, I went through a uh, master's, a terminal master's program uh, that was not mm -hmm. focused on CRM. And I came out of that and, and I had all of the qualifications to make the next step to a project manager in a CRM firm. And I did that. But along the way, I didn't pick up certain crucial skills like writing proposals or managing budgets or really becoming mm -hmm. uh, better versed in laws or management practices um, or applying mm -hmm. new technology in practical and effective ways. Are those things that uh, this program aims to integrate? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we do have one key course in CRM which definitely covers laws and uh, proposal writing and some and uh, and stuff on management. We have a heritage course which covers uh, quite a bit on laws and uh, you know and also and you know section 106 how the hell you do that that kind of thing. Um, so uh, yeah, definitely you know we 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 will be uh, and we are we are already and we will be addressing those those kinds of issues. I think one of the keys though to any kind of program like this or a career in CRM is you need both the certificate and you need experience. And um, we can, of course, give people the certificate and we can give them a little bit of experience. But in the end, to, to, to move into a management position, you're going to have to have both. So one thing we would really like to do is uh, recruit people who have experience and who want to now, you know, are now ready to, to try to move into a, a more management position. Excellent. So I might add, too, in terms of in terms of new technologies, we've just hired two new faculty, um, 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 and I say that, and then the, and then the names uh, uh, fly on my head. That's that's awful. Uh, Carl Lupo, <laughs> Lippo, who is uh, who works actually in uh, Easter Island, okay. but who has extensive experience in North America, and who uh, does a lot with the remote right. sensing and drones and that kind of stuff, um, mm -hmm. and um, so, you know, and we and we also have a new faculty member who's doing a lot with remote sensing and stuff. And so we're going to be adding, um, we're going to be adding, um, you know, uh, practical courses, you know, based on that, uh, on, on those things, uh, which will give it, put us in a good position to, uh, to uh, provide, uh, provide that kind of update training. in CRM, a weekly podcast, ask CRM professionals eight simple questions. The first questions establish education, location, and experience. The last questions are a reflection of that experience, and the answers will surprise you. Check out the show on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash profiles. On that page, you can also request to be interviewed for the show. It only takes 20 minutes and you don't need any special equipment. Let's get back to the show. All right, Bill. Bill, we had some connectivity issues with Bill, but he's back now and he's got a couple questions for you. Go ahead, Bill. I'm always lurking somewhere in the world. Uh, <laughs> this last summer, uh, this last summer, I taught a field school in Boise. It was an urban archaeology thing, and we actually, had, um, I, I actually added your uh, uh, your collaboration with uh, Sonia Adelay in uh, transforming archaeology. I just added the first chapter mm -hmm. as as one of the readings for the summer, and I mean, it it sounds like it's a totally awesome. Uh, a totally awesome uh, approach towards uh, community-based archaeology, at least. And I also am familiar mm -hmm. with your book, Archaeology as Political Action. And I'm just wondering how <laughs> some of those so that some of those ideas are, are maybe uh, seeping into the uh, program there at Binghamton. 
Well, I think that uh, our emphasis on Bennington and Hampton to do kind of, uh, you know, uh, community architecture in a broad sense. This is not just part of my work, but it's been part of, uh, of you know, most of the faculty's work and trying to do an archaeology that's critically engaged in the, uh, in the modern world. Um, and I, I think that's the thing that we, we have well established. And I think it's something that, like I said, we've been training students in CRM for many years. Uh, and I think one of the reasons they have succeeded is they have come with a strong sense of of community practice and working you know, with people and doing uh, you know kind of an involved archaeology. But that's that that's the, I would see that as kind of a theoretical strength that we you know have had in place for some time. I definitely think that's a good approach. Um, right now, a lot of the work I do is really actually coming from communities. So. Um, I'm a RA with uh, the Bureau of Applied Research and Anthropology, and so sometimes yep. I'm doing archaeology and other times I'm doing anthropology. But it's almost always coming from yeah. See, hide any others from communities. Oh, I will. Yeah, yeah actually, she's the one who I'm, I'm trying to uh, make happy by uh, putting in the midnight oil. Actually. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, good, good. Yeah, but I mean, uh, that's that's an excellent approach. I, I mean, I'm just wondering, like, you know, how do we reconcile that? Because reading these books and me having those kind of ideas and then I try to bring that to cultural resource management where, you know, they're just really looking at the budget and, and the uh, the Gantt chart and saying, well, that's great, but fit it in the next 42 hours, you know, like, uh, you know, how, how can we work that kind of stuff in? How can we learn how to work that stuff in? Well, I think you have to. I mean, where I work, where I do my own research, which is the southwestern United States, um, you know, to do uh, any kind of CRM or contract archaeology um, in the traditional sense and not be actively involved with people is going to, you're setting yourself up for failure. <laughs> um, between NAGPRA and other uh, kinds of requirements, uh, you got to know how to do that. Um, it's not something extra. And in terms, and in terms of the firms that I'm familiar with and that I work with a lot of here in the Southwest, uh, that's very much part of what they do. I mean, if you look at Desert Archaeology West or any number of uh, these firms, uh, major firms in the Southwest, uh, working with indigenous communities is an essential part of doing contract archaeology. Yeah, you're right about that. I agree. Absolutely. Over here in California too is a, it's a pretty big deal. Yeah, and that's something that you know. Again, we've uh, we've been at for uh, doing for quite a while. So. I think that's incredibly valuable to get from somewhere in the east because you know, going through undergrad and grad school and most of my CRM career in the east, that was some that was a component that was very much lacking throughout. Mm -hmm. Well, I know in upstate New York, Nina Versace, who is our who directs our uh, public archaeology uh, facility, and who is, you know, part of, of course, part of the SEMA program. Uh, she has a very long, well-established relationship with Hoda Gashoni, and um, uh, I know we have placed many people, uh, you know, uh, because they had that kind of background and they they knew how to approach that. Um, so. You know, um, I, I can't speak for the, all of the East because you know, my own field experience is in the Southwest, which of course is very different. But in upstate New York, uh, working with Hoda Nashoni seems it has impressed me as being very important. Excellent. Okay. You guys got any more questions for Randy here? Well, uh, I mean, yeah, th I think that. Uh, so I mean, I guess maybe my my hidden motivation, I'm in school now and I wasn't in school. So it's like a fish that got out of water and breathed air. And now it's trying to actually breathe water again. <laughs> and so I see all these, I see all this stuff happening here at the university and, and Arizona is an excellent school, you know, and, and it's in like the heartland of great, um, you know, connected and uh, community oriented research, but it just seems mm -hmm. like maybe, um, those are just shining lights in the, the overall scheme of things, you know, working for other companies across the United States, just like uh, uh, Chris Sims talking about. Um, it doesn't seem like this kind of connection. I mean, you were saying that if you don't connect, you're in trouble. Well, that's exactly what's happening mm -hmm. with so many companies that I've worked for. They are actually in trouble or they went out of business or something happened and mm -hmm. they're just not there anymore, you know? And so, uh, yeah. 
I, I see how this is the future, and, but I also see how there's a difficult, there's a disconnect between what we're learning in school and this future that we're, you know, going to all walk out into. So um, I guess I'm going to look for strategies on how we can actually, you know, make this more, uh, more of your, your college life so that when you get out, you just think that's how it should be. Well, yeah. I mean, that is definitely important, but I mean, if you, if you look at Arizona, if you look at Nieves' work with the Blackfoot, or if you look at uh, T.J. Ferguson's long, long involvement, uh, or if you talk about desert archaeology, or again, uh, another major firm in the southwest is Paleo West. I mean, all of these places, if they weren't working effectively with indigenous people, they'd have to shut down. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I think that that reality is going to come about uh, independent of what we do, and we have to be prepared yeah. to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, you're exactly right. And those those firms you noted are definitely, you know, among the top. I, I, I Things changed after I moved down here and started doing CRM. I worked for years in Washington and I worked for a good company, but it's just, it's not the same kind of way that it is down in Arizona, you know? And so, uh, yeah. you know, you and I think a certain way, but then I talk to other people and they just kind of laugh at us like, yeah, that's not really how it works in Ohio or that's not really what's going on in, you know, Wisconsin or whatever. And I'm just... I don't, I don't really know what to say because I it's been so long since I worked in another area where it wasn't this way. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, my, most of my, you know, my personal experience, you know, all, you know, of course what we do as archaeologists is all very regional. And my personal experience is in the Southwest. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> you know, um, and here, um, you know, this, this, this is the reality. Mm-hmm. I, I can't speak for Wisconsin or, Minnesota or Washington, <laughs> right? Right. Because <laughs> I don't work there. <laughs> well, I, I yeah. know I can I can speak a little for California, you know, out here in the West, and and like Bill said, in Washington State as well, heavy, heavy, heavy tribal involvement. In fact, it's kind of a surprise if you do a project that doesn't have tribal involvement. That would be an odd thing out here in California. So. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Chris Webster here from the Archaeology Podcast Network, and we're giving away an iPad Mini 4 to one of our listeners. The iPad Mini 4 came out in September. It's a 16 gigabyte space gray iPad with AT&T cellular ready antenna. All that means is it comes with a GPS. You do not need to get a data plan. And you don't even need to be on AT&T if you never get a plan to get a data plan. It just has GPS. It also has a fingerprint sensor and Apple Pay ready and all the good perks that come with that. So it's a good iPad. We use them in the field. There are two easy ways to enter. One, do a Profiles and CRM interview before December 15th, 2015, or recommend someone for an interview. You'll both get an entry once the interview is posted. If you want to know more about Profiles and CRM, go to www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash profiles. All the questions are listed right there. The other way to enter is to like the APN Facebook page and share it with your friends on Facebook to get the word out about our awesome podcasts. The winner will be announced December 16th, 2015 at 4 p.m. Pacific time. So get your entries in, send me those emails for people that want to do the Profiles in Syrian podcast, and good luck to everyone. Hi, Mac. Take us out with a binary solo. All right. Well, I want to bring it back to the program a little bit. Um, Randy, is there anything that, that we didn't ask you that uh, that you think listeners should know about the program before they all run off and, and post their applications to you? <laughs> <laughs> I guess the main, well, I guess two things. One is if you want to find the program, the best way is probably Google uh, Binghamton Anthropology, and that will get you to our uh, our webpage. We'll have links to that page in our show notes on the on this podcast episode as well. Oh, great. Yeah. I guess the other thing I'd like to say is that uh, I realize that uh, this would not appeal to most people. But, uh, we're in a good position, actually, to train people who want to work in the Southwest. Mm-hmm. Now, I realize that most people in the Southwest are going to go to a Southwest school. Uh, <laughs> but uh, between myself and Ruth Van Dyke, we're very active in the Southwest. We're very well connected with the CRM uh, mm-hmm. programs out here. And so if somebody wanted to do Southwest uh at Binghamton, uh, and Binghamton has a long history of doing Southwest archaeology that also goes back to the 70s. People like Bill mm-hmm. Light and Fred Plogg were there. Oh, yeah. Uh, and if somebody wanted to do, um, uh, you know, Southwest work and for some reason wanted to stay in the East, either for family reasons or because they're New York residents or whatever, uh, we could uh, certainly make that happen. Wow.
Okay, that's that's really good to know because I I'm assuming you know people look regionally for their degrees and we we have actually yeah. a, quite a number of listeners that that work or live in the southwest that might be interested to hear this you know as a as an alternative mm-hmm. out of state tuition might be yeah. an issue for them but you know there might be ways around that yeah well we you know uh, we have we currently have in, uh, you know in our PhD program we currently have about seven or eight south people working in the southwest mm-hmm. and uh, honestly most of them have. Uh, some reason that they want to do the south, Southwest archaeology, but they need to be, east. you know, again, family or it's where they're from or something. But uh, um, it is it is something, uh, you know, in this new program, uh, we could get we can get people internships in the Southwest. We can you know, we can make it happen. You know, that does that does remind me of another question, especially mm-hmm. when you're talking about working in the Southwest um, from from the University of New York. The thesis program, you know, for your project or for your thesis topic or whatever you're going to do, do people, do you expect people to um, figure that out when they get there? Or do you want them to come with something in mind that they want to do and maybe even a data set to work on or permission from a company to work on? Or do you have something that ties in with some of your work in the Southwest or even with the CRM firm at the university? What are the, what are the options for people for their, for their thesis project while they're there? I think I would say all of the above. I mean, uh, I've probably... Uh, I've at this point I've supervised like 25 or 30 MA theses, mm-hmm. and probably 15 of them were based on data from our uh, public archaeology facility. Okay. So that that's certainly a possibility. Uh, we would hope that people, uh, you know, in their internship would gain data. Uh, if somebody comes like comes from a company, you know, from past experience with something they want to do, uh, that would certainly work. So so I would say all of the above. All right. Well, like we said at the top of the show, the applications are generally due in uh, the beginning of February. But uh, if you happen to miss that for some reason, but you'll learn that uh, you know they'll they'll take them up through the end of spring. But however, your first lesson in CRM is don't miss that deadline. So, yeah. <laughs> don't, you know. well, the, the, the one the one thing about the first of February is we do have some very limited funds, okay. very limited funds to That's to offer to people. But and and those will be. Um, you know, to, to get those, you'll have to apply for mid by mid February. Outstanding, outstanding. I don't think it sets a good tone if you turn in your first uh, your first thing that you do for a, for an MA program for a CRM degree. Uh, you know, for a CRM focused type of thing is turn in your application late. That doesn't seem to set a good uh, a good tone. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a good start. No, not a good yeah. start. No, yeah. Good. All right. Well, sounds good. Um, do you guys have any last minute questions? I think um, I think we nailed down everything about the program, and I think it sounds uh, I think it sounds decent. And that you guys have a good uh, a good thing for people to look into. And I, I like the fact that you can go there, and and it's not essentially strictly regional, like you would assume, um, because of the southwestern component. Mm-hmm. I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a well, good connection also, for anyone in the east who wants to get their foot in the door working mm-hmm. in the southwest. That's a yeah. rare opportunity for yeah, people in the east. It's a very rare opportunity. That's a good point because it's notoriously yeah. difficult to get into the southwest if you didn't go to school there. Well, you got to have connections, and we have connections. Outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Randy, I think that's going to do it. Um, we're going to end it here, but check the show notes for this podcast for links to the program at Binghamton University. And like I said before, if you plan on doing this, don't don't delay. You know, get your application in now. And, and I would honestly say if funding is an issue for you, what, which it is for everybody, um, and you're worried about loans and stuff like that, figure that part out later. Get your application in, get, get it going, get that out of the way, and then if you get accepted, then you can start worrying about money probably for the rest of your life. But worry about that later. So... <laughs> That's it for another episode of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. Links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast, which can be found at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash CRM Arc Podcast. If you like the show and want to comment, please do. You can leave comments about this or any other episode on the website or on the iTunes page for the episode. You can also email me at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com or use the contact form on the podcast webpage. If you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode, email us. Use the contact form on the website or tweet your questions with the hashtag CRMARCpodcast or you can tag at ARCpodnet in your tweet. Please share the link to the show wherever you saw it. 
can share CRM archaeology related items on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere else for that matter. Be sure to use the hashtag CRMARC so the community can see and comment. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so on iTunes or on Stitcher Radio. You can also type the name of the podcast into your favorite podcasting app and subscribe that way. Don't forget to go over to iTunes and leave a review of the show. It helps us get noticed so more people can find our podcast and benefit from the content. Also, send us show suggestions and interview suggestions. We want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere, and we want to know what you want to know about. Also, please consider donating to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Your donations help fund our bandwidth and contribute to our editing costs. Thanks to everyone for joining me this week. Thanks also to the listeners for tuning in, and we'll see you on the field. Goodbye. Take it easy. Adios. Bye. This show is produced by Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.